Good evening all. Wishing you all a happy new year. We on behalf of the SRC Alumni Association and the Triple Department welcome you for this 82nd webinar talk, Building Anti-Fragility at Individual and Collective Levels. Our principal ma'am has conveyed her wishes for this event. We welcome the speaker of the day, Mr. Abhishek V. Paul, faculty members, current students and all alumni friends. This event is also a co-event of the Kovai Villa 14th edition. Mr. Abhishek, after his engineering, completed MBA in marketing and consulting at IIT Madras. He has joined CTS as associate consultant and worked for two and a half years. Then he was with Infosys for six and a half years. For the past five years, he is with Crisflow as a culture shepherd. With over 15 years of experience, the rapid growth st uh, stagnation, dec uh, decline of the industry has made him curious about uh, intrinsic motivators, its impact on sustainable greatness, and more importantly, how to scale it successfully in an organization. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. I mean, I, I always like to see people's faces when I'm talking, especially I don't think I've met most of you. So if you need some time to make sure your background is fine and you're comfortable, I'd really appreciate it. It will be good to know who is there. Um, so thank you so much for this opportunity to share something that uh, I have been, like I said, uh, working on for the past uh, 10 to 15 years, I guess. Uh, it's become my job, uh, but it was always a question that I had. And um, yeah, I'm just going to share a little bit about this particular um, topic with you. Uh, and to contextualize it a bit, um, I think uh, what, they, what was shared in the introduction is very simple. Um, most companies uh, start out uh, very good. Uh, I mean, I've worked in Cognizant when it was 30,000. I guess it's about, uh, I don't know, three to four lakh of the employees now. Infosys was about a lakh when I joined. It's again the same size. Most companies, when they start, they're really good. But somehow over time, uh, they become a little bit more uh, predictable. They become a little bit more bureaucratic. And uh, the energy that was there in the early days is no longer there for the people who join. So people also tend to just join in do something and leave very early. Right? So, I, I mean, when I joined, it was the third founder of Infosys who was uh, Mr. Krish Gopalakrishnan, who was the CEO at that time. Earlier, it was Mr. NRN and then Mr. Nandan Nilakeni. Uh, when I left, it was the first uh, outside CEO, which was Mr. Vishal Sikha, who had come over to try and change Infosys culture. Uh, but what we realized is, once the company or any organization, you can take the college also as an example, um, or maybe even family units, right? Once they become a certain size, it's very difficult to turn things around uh, because now we are operating out of uh, multiple geographies. There's a lot of dependencies. The size itself is too large, right? Like uh, typically when companies become a certain size, they become very, uh, they structured into departments. Each department just does its own thing. They don't know what others are do, doing, et cetera, et cetera. So changing a company isn't as simple as when you were probably 100,000 member companies. Right? But I wanted to find out what it was because all of us want to work in a place that is a really great company. We want to do great things. But at the same time, we are uh, probably working in organizations which are made very big and are, uh, possibly not um, able to make the change, even if their intention is to be a really cutting edge company, right? So uh, the question of anti-fragility is also applicable at a societal level, I guess, uh, the fragility of society. Uh, we first heard, encountered it in 2008 when there was a recession, maybe some of you earlier, even in 2000 when we had the Y2K bug, right? The first time when the dot-com bubble burst, uh, when we was we were just entering college, Ramakrishna at that time in 2000, and a uh, lot of people lost their jobs. Uh, there was no campus placement, etc. People quickly forgot about it. 2008, you had another recession. We went through the same cycle. 
now in 2019 20 we are going through a pandemic which is a started a recession it stopped it's starting we really don't know what's happening right um, so the idea of anti fragility is very simple um, it is to say that crisis events will hit everybody either at a societal level or at a personal level when i talk personal level i know some of us might have uh, lost close friends family members it's a very difficult time some of us in our careers have lost jobs um, some of us maybe have gone through financial trouble uh, now that you have a, when you enter your 40s you will hear understand what life is about outside the college it is not just about the job there are so many things that are happening so crisis events are going to hit both at a organizational or institutional level at a societal level or at an individual level or in this case maybe all three now the question is not uh, the answer sorry is not to try and predict when the next crisis was, will hit because people who predicted i mean were trying to predict the next financial crisis could not predict the pandemic so the next crisis is not going to be a pandemic it's going to be something else right? people might say ai people might say whatever it is but my thinking is that whatever you predict is not really going to be the thing that hits us the most right so the so rather than trying to find out when the next tsunami is going to hit us the question here is what can i as an individual do or as an organization do so that when the crisis hits whatever the crisis is we are able to survive and maybe even thrive right that's the question um so to do that is the concept of anti fragility uh, let me just share my screen maybe this will give you uh, it's not a coin a term i've coined so Let's see, I'm getting used to WebEx. Please forgive me. Uh, yeah, okay. Right. I'm hoping you can see my screen right now. I can get a confirmation from somebody that will be good. Yes, uh, yes, we can see your screen. Perfect, Perfect. right? So, um, let's get real, right? Like, uh, I don't know. Uh, I think very few of my batchmates are here. Maybe there's one or two of them. I can recognize some names. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you like you're an industry expert with close to two decades of experience. If you're a professor in the college with two again two decades of close to two decades of experience, or if you're somebody early on in your career, right? Or maybe even a student, right? Our goal is all the same, irrespective of the context. We want to do great things. Maybe we want to create an impact. Um, that's what we want to do. Right there, we might have chosen to be a lecturer or a professor, an academician, or we might have chosen to be somebody in the industry. Might we might choose to be somebody in the public services? Doesn't really matter. At the core, we want to do something great, uh, and we want to create an impact. But what's the practical side of it? While the goal might be personal or individual, if you want to do something really great, we can't do it alone. We have to have a team. Or a company. Now, it doesn't matter if the company is something that I start as an entrepreneur or I join as an employee. Really, doesn't matter. All we are saying is it's not an individual game. It is a collective effort, especially for long time, uh, long term success. Right? I mean, Sachin Tendulkar could win the World Cup only when he had the right team around him. Right? Doesn't matter if he was the greatest batsman ever. That's the side. So the question is, do we know what makes a great team or a company? Typically, what I hear people say is, I'm good, I want to do something great, but the rest of the people are not great. They're not allowing me to do great things. I've heard this for the last 15 years. I myself have said this at certain times, and it's not to say that it's not true, but I'm, all I'm saying is that cannot be always true, or that cannot be the only reason, right? So that's what we're trying to do. How do we achieve this goal, given the practical context that it has to be a collective effort, and do we know or are we clear on what makes a great team or a great individual? Right? So to address those questions is what I uh, wanted to bring in this idea of anti-fragility. This was from a book written by uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb. Uh, maybe you've heard of some of his more famous book, which is Fooled by Randomness and Black Swan, uh, etc. Um, anti-fragile is one of my favorite books. It's a thick book, um, but uh, it's something that I really love to read. I would encourage you guys to read it or maybe watch the lectures whenever you have time. Um, I think we all understand what fragility is, right? Like we've seen these uh, 
maybe when we order things from Amazon or Flipkart, right? We when we order things, if it's something uh, that we have to handle carefully, there is this big sticker that is put there, right? Even when we move places, fragile handle with care, right? Typically, what it means, there is only certain level of stress, stress or strength this this particular item has. Anything beyond that, it will burst, right? And it, you can't put it back together. Right? Now, um, that is at a material level. Now, if you look at it at an individual human level, it is, hey, there's only so much emotional stress I can handle. There's only so much financial stress I can handle. There is only so much mental stress I can handle. So much physical stress I can handle. Anything beyond that, till then I'm operating well, I'm doing well, I'm doing my job well, no problems. Uh, but anything beyond that, there is some uncertainty or there is some additional stress, I break down, right? I break down and I'm not able to perform at my best, either at work, or at home, doesn't really matter. Right, so that is fragility at a human level. Um, to understand this, I don't know. Uh, maybe you, I'm assuming there are some Kamalas and fans. One of his favorite, one of my famous favorite movies of his uh, is Kurudi Punal, right? And that he makes a very nice statement. Uh, he says every man has a breaking point. You just need to find it, right? Um, and that's true for us, right? Like I remember at college, I felt like I could do anything. Uh, very quickly when I joined work, I realized, you know, there is only a limit that I can do. I need to strengthen myself in many other areas. Um, so fragility is something that is so is performing well. When there is a breaking point, it stops, right? Like it's no longer functional. It's no longer useful, right? Uh, resilience or robustness is it will it will be think of it like bulletproof glass, right? The glass is there. If it's a normal glass, a bullet or a brick hits it, the glass breaks, no longer useful. If it's bulletproof glass, the grass, the bullet or the brick hits it, it still functions as a glass. But anti-fragility is actually interesting. Um, there is no word called anti-fragility before uh, Nicholas, uh, before Nassim Taleb coined it in th three years ago, four years ago now. Uh, it's interesting because it's a concept, right? The concept is when something hits, a stress hits, that that particular thing actually gets better, right? So imagine I lose my job, right? It can break me down. That is fragility. Like I, I become emotionally, and I'm talking from personal experience, uh, when I lose my job, it it's, it's an emotional thing, right? And then there is the financial burden. Everything is a problem. You have family to provide for, etc. Resilience is okay. I, I I've lost my job, but I have some savings. I can do it. I have my resume prepared. I have some contacts. I can reach out and figure something. Anti fragility is actually does your career become better? Do you become better at your job because you've lost your current job, right? And if so, how? What is that mindset that is there that helps somebody become better when? the pressure hits them, right? That is anti-fragility. So to give a current example, how many of our lives have become better emotionally, mentally, physically, financially, uh, intellectually because of the lockdown and the pandemic, right? Some of us who have managed to survive will say we are resilient. Hey, I managed to do it. I've still got my job. I'm still able to provide for my family. That's great. But how many of us have actually said, this particular stress event, which has broken, damaged so many people, maybe including us personally, now I can actually feel that it's make it made me better, right? And I'm not just talking about a positive attitude, it's something beyond that. It is actually practically made me better, right? So somebody who, an institution which is anti-fragile or a person which is anti, who is anti-fragile will actually look for stress events. Right? These are people who thrive in stress events. So when you talk about entrepreneurs, maybe they have it. People who want to work in startups have it. These are people who thrive in uncertainty, in unpredictability. Right? Uh, a lot of that's why you see a lot of youngsters entering startups or star, etc., starting companies, etc. Because once they have, once we have responsibilities, we see, uh, we have certain commitments. Um, we see what how difficult it is to actually run a company, then it's difficult to go and start a company because we're always thinking about things like this. Uh, but the question is, are we, there are two ways stress can happen. One is 
uh, like the financial crisis in 08, like uh, all the things that I spoke of, including the current pandemic, it happens to us. Like your company can go into bankruptcy and lay you off, right? I don't know. Uh, I hope that doesn't happen, but it can happen. These are external events out of which I have no control. So the event hits me and then I react. Now, my question uh, is slightly different. My uh, invitation to you is slightly different. It is, can I actively go and seek out stress events? How am I putting my body under stress? I'll give you a very simple example, right? Uh, one of the things that happened uh, during the pandemic is people's health became a really big point. Now, so we got vaccinations, all of that, which is important. We followed all the protocols, etc. But my question is, uh, just like a virus mutates, the problem with health is not just one dimension, which a particular virus has exposed. My health has so many other parameters, which I'm not even aware of, right? Like I, my thyroid levels, my pressure levels, my sugar levels, my heart, whatever it is, my kidney functions. There are so many things I really have no idea, right? I can't wait for another disease to come and then see, oh, no, I should do this. Right? We are always reacting. We are trying to protect ourselves, but actively figuring out how to be healthy is a different mindset. Right? Those are the people we are talking about. These are people who are actually becoming healthy because they've realized, okay, how fragile our body is. And they are not just trying to protect with the current disease or virus, but they've said, for me to be healthy and living a successful life till I'm, let's say, 75, 80, I need to ensure I start doing these things today, right? That's what we're talking about. These are people who will then intentionally start exercising, managing their diets, getting regular checkups, ensuring that they are at the, let's say the 95th to the 98th percentile in their age group, right? Those are people we are talking about who have an anti-fragile mindset. So what does it mean to be anti-fragile at any, uh, uh, now I'm gonna scope it down uh, if you read the book, you'll have wide range of applications, but I'm going to scope it down for the next 15 minutes to what is anti-fragility at an individual level. Uh, governed from my experience of having worked in large companies, IT services companies, and two startups, the current one, which I am uh, ha uh, happy to work with. And maybe just uh, give me a second while I share a little bit about the company so that you are aware of it. Uh, so. Currently, I'm working at Kissflow, like uh, it was mentioned. Kissflow is a SaaS product company based out of Chennai. We are at the World Trade Center in uh, Perungudi. In fact, uh, we were the first people to move into this, uh, the World Trade Center, which is possibly the tallest building in Chennai right now, uh, in uh, August of 2021. Like when most people were wondering what to do, we said, no, uh, we need to get back to life. And we've started working out of office. We have a remote plus model, which is slightly different. You can read up about it on our website if you'd like. Uh, uh, Kissflow, like I said, is a SaaS product company. Uh, we have customers in over 160 countries right now. Um, and we, we've got some of the top brands that are using our product um, right from within India and across the globe. We are also, recognized as industry experts in our area, which is a digital workplace and workflow automation, uh, which is certified both by uh, the community that uses our products as a leader, as well as by the industry, right? So uh, we've had the privilege of uh, competing against some of the biggest players across the world, right? Not just in India, right? These are all uh, universal competitors that we are working against. Um, so uh, we started at workflow management, which you see on the right, but now we've expanded. Uh, the pandemic has actually accelerated the uh, need for a digital workplace where people want to work remotely, have to work remotely, and they need tools that can help them do that, manage all of that uh, without people and paperwork, et cetera. So that's where we are right now, and uh, it's exciting times. When I joined the company five years ago, it was 90 people working out of one office in Tidal. Uh, today, we are close to 400 people working out of uh, one of the newest offices in Chennai in World Trade Center. So we've grown four times in size and it's been exciting growth. And as we've grown is when uh, we saw this problem, right? 
we were a, we felt we were a great company where everybody wanted to work in when we were small we were about 100 now that we are four times the size how do we ensure that we still continue to be a great company that we do not become like those it services company which as they became bigger uh, they lost its charm right they are still doing great work don't get me wrong but that excitement that energy that space that freedom for you to do what you wanted has gone away so we wanted to see how to do that uh, as we grow in size. And that's why I joined this company. I'll talk a little bit about it a little later on. But we said the only way to do that is to be very specific about the kind of people we hire. Uh, so if you look at our hiring, we have a value alignment stage, which happens as a final round of any interview. Uh, if it's a senior role, I handle that or if my team does it for other roles. And this is something that where we look for specific values of the individual after their technical and domain competencies are all tested. We say no, only if this person exhibits these values, can we hire them? Because only these people can thrive in his flow. And at the same time, uh, we want only these kind of people because that's the only way we want to grow, right? So what are the kind of people we look at? We look at them with an anti-fragile mindset, mindset. What does that mean? It means five simple things. Uh, obviously I've taken a smaller, I uh, think contextualizing it to work life, professional life in a product company in uh, India, but you can always talk about it uh, and read more about it in the book. Right? The first thing I've noticed is uh, people who, a lot of people want to work in startups, uh, but a lot of them don't know why they want to work in startups. I mean, there is this excitement. I can understand it. It's like when people want to join IT services companies because they want to go abroad, etc. There is a glamour element to it, uh, but uh, unfortunately, the people who do really well are those who have clarity on why, personal clarity on why they want to be here. For example, if if you really, for that, they have to understand the dark side of startups or the harder side of startups and still want to do it, right? I, I might have to work long hours. I might not get my salary certain months. I might not have a predictable career growth. I might have to do what is needed rather than having somebody come and teach me all of that, right? So are people still willing to do that? Uh, a lot of people want to join startups because what is projected about startups, but they don't really know why they are uh, wanting to join startups. This is a blog that we wrote some time back uh, after a conversation with our CEO, Suresh Sambandham. Uh, it's, it's available on Medium if you guys want to take a look at it. But personal clarity uh, beyond tangible benefits of working in any place is by that I mean um, compensation by that I mean position by that I mean predictable career growth all of that right if all of that is not there why would you still work here or uh, which is the place you would want to work right don't get me wrong I don't I'm not saying salary is not important but I, I don't think that can be the primary driver right there has to be something more and what is it for you right? um, for example, uh, five years back when I joined Kisflow, I did not, uh, I, I had a simple statement which I shared. Uh, I was clear on what I wanted to work on. I had worked for 10 years till then. And then I was able to share in a clear email, this is what I'm good at and this is what I want to work on and this is why I want to work in this space. And uh, I sent this email, right? It was just a cold email. I selected a few companies which were of a certain size and I sent this email. And Suresh, who was the CEO, saw that email and he responded the next day, right? Like, actually, he responded the same day and we met the same week, right? So once you have clarity, the right opportunities will be, you will find it. Uh, at that time, Orange Cable, uh, Kissflow was not a company that a lot of people knew, right? So if we are going to companies which everybody knows, then we are actually maybe uh, influenced by the PR, right? Like PR or peers or whatever it is. You need to know what you want, and once you have it, the right people, the right opportunities will find you, right? But it takes time, and it's okay to make mistakes along the way. So that's one. See, cl crystal clarity on what, and it's not something that once you find, you always have it. So for those of you who work for 15, 20 years, I, I would encourage you to continue validating it. This is why I wanted to work in this space. Is it still, still true today? Because you are not the person you were 20 years ago or 10 years ago or even five years ago, you are evolving as a person, your understanding, your desires will evolve. And you, it, it's important that you constantly check, why am I doing what I'm doing today? 
not why I got into this job uh, 15 years ago. Number two, uh, all, we always say this, look for signals. Uh, I think as it's changing now, but I think as a culture, we are used to being spoon fed, right? Like we, we've been told what to study, when to study and how to write the exams and how to get good marks. And even in, even in workplaces, we are told exactly what to do. There is somebody monitoring us. So we do what we are told very well in a timely manner and we assume we will be rewarded for it, right? Uh, but it doesn't work today. Today, all we say is that you can sit here and work for any company across the world on any field that you want, but it's important that I pick out the signals, right? My antenna needs to be tuned. Uh, even in a company, like the manager or the CEO might say something once or twice. After that, it's up to me to kind of go ahead and do something about it. Not just say, oh, he didn't follow up on me. Maybe he said it simply, right? Uh, nobody's going to follow up with us, right? They're basically looking for people who will take initiative, not necessarily the best person. There is a difference. We always assume the best person will do the job. Not really. It's the person who takes the initiative, who actually gets the opportunity, and then that makes him better. Right? Whereas the person, other person might be really competent at it, but he really doesn't take the initiative because nobody asked him personally or specifically. Right? So wherever you are, what are the signals you might be missing, uh, which can give you an opportunity to really go to the next level or try something interesting. Ah, this is one of my favorites. This is a switch we did as a company where we became uh, outcome focused, not effort focused. Right? Uh, I mean, this is since the new year, I don't know how many people have have uh, fitness goals. I am one. Uh, but, but the interesting thing is um, going to the gym will not necessarily make you, will not necessarily make you achieve your goal, right? And simple example I give is some people say, hey, I want to lose weight, so I'm going to the gym. I tell them, you know, going to the gym is not necessarily going to make you lose weight because uh, weight loss is 80% up to your diet. Right, so you can go to the gym. You can try whatever gym that you want. That are cult fit, right? Like they have their different styles. They'll have dancing. They'll have boxing. They'll have all of these things. But you will be putting a lot of effort to lose very little weight, right? Because it doesn't work. Uh, so once I know, okay, my focus is on to lose weight, but and exercise makes me fit, not necessarily to lose weight. I will know where to put my effort, right? So telling people I I walk every day or I go to the gym three times a week or four times a week, or uh, I, I might look at my calendar. I mean, this is one thing that happens in remote work. Our calendar is always full. So we assume that if our calendar is always full every day of the week, I'm so busy, I must be doing important work. Not necessarily. The question is, hey, what is your outcome? What do you want to do? If I'm clear on the outcome I want, then the activity will follow that. In fact, you will be doing things differently from others. Right? A lot of us believe if I just do the activity, somehow the outcome will be achieved. It's like thinking if I just keep batting uh, and hitting the ball, every ball, somehow we win the match. It doesn't work like that. You know it doesn't work like that. right? Anybody who's playing a match has a clear outcome. I need to win the match. So, so to win the match, in a certain situation, if it's a test match, I might have to defend. In a certain situation, I might have to attack. Right, So all of that depends only on the outcome. The activity can change. I, as a batsman, I'm the same batsman. I would be attacking, I might be defending, I might be do, or I might be helping somebody else, I might be a runner for somebody else. All of those are different ways I play my role only because I'm clear on what the outcome is. I feel a lot of us, including people at my age, do not have this difference. They just think, okay, for example, Attending college or attending work, attendance is something great. Not really, right? I always used to wonder uh, what was the difference between my engineering and my master's. Master's was in IIT. When I studied, there was no attendance, right? They didn't care, <laughs> right? So basically, they'd say, you want to study, you want to do well, you want to get good marks, it's up to you. If you feel the class adds value, come to the class. Not, but the standard is the same for everybody. Whether you attend class or don't attend class, you have to, you'll have the same exam. You'll have to do well. You'll be competing with the same people. So some people would enjoy attending class, some classes. So we would attend classes we really enjoyed. Other times we would miss some classes. That's fine. Right. But that was because it's outcome focused. Right. 
So I think a lot of times we need, we get so caught up in working long hours, this hard work mindset that we really don't understand. Right? Let me just quickly go through. Uh, number four, this is another thing that we, I feel a lot of people are missing out. We have become a, a consumption uh, culture. By that, what I mean is we are constantly consuming information. People always say, hey, I am on YouTube listening to this podcast or I'm listening to that podcast or I'm, uh, I follow this person on Twitter, on social media, whatever it is. Just so, or I read these blogs, etc. I would say, again, that is effort focused. What is the outcome? I want to learn something. When do you really learn? And why do you want to learn something? I want to do something. Okay. So if you want to do something, you need to have practical knowledge, which means the learning that I have, I need to start articulating it in my own words. Right? A lot of people are not comfortable. And presentation is actually easy to do because you just talk. Uh, but when you write it down as a blog or put down something on it in a way that others understand, your clarity actually increases. And I, I honestly, I see a lot of people, senior leaders, unable to do this. And so their impact is limited. So, see, once you write a blog or make a video or whatever it is, it can be consumed by anybody, any point of time. But if I have to talk all the time, I'm using a lot of energy and I'm reaching out to only a certain group of people at a certain time. Uh, asynchronous impact does not happen. Asynchronous impact is basically I put something out there, which even 10 years from now, 15 years from now, somebody will read it. If they find value, there might be some connection that happens. Uh, it's very easy to complain about things. At work, I see people saying, oh, this is not there, that is not there. Um, but all we tell people is be, a, I mean, the uh, famous Gandhi adage, right? Be the change you want to be. It's very simple. Right? Either practically start involving in things outside your specific job responsibility. Uh, we call that system responsibility in KISS flow. Job responsibility is what your job demands from you. Link responsibility is how you work well with your supply chain. And system responsibility is when you get involved in proactively in things that can actually help the larger organization in a small way. Maybe starts off in a small way. Right? But creating can be anything, right? Like it's basically you put something out there. It could be uh, a community you create or it could be blogs you write. It could be uh, video conversations you strike up, but it's recorded and put out there. Um, thought leader is a very big word, but it starts very small. It starts with having clarity and an ability to share uh, different concepts or your own work concepts in a manner that is beneficial first for your community but then to a larger community that takes practice. And when you do that, automatically you will find again, like-minded people connecting with you. Lastly, um, and I'm not going to even tell who this person is as I made this, I'm sure you would know. Um, I, I like this statement by Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel was one of the founders of PayPal, uh, partners with Elon Musk, the one, one of the first initial outside investors in Facebook. Uh, he's an, uh, he wrote an amazing book called Zero to One. Uh, I think you, I, I would highly recommend this book. He, he's, he's someone who's called a contrarian. Contrarian is somebody who thinks differently from the crowd, right? And he said this, which is competition is for losers. So if I am comparing myself uh, with my peer group, right? Like I said, some of them are in this call. I'm out, I've already lost it, right? Because once I am clear, this is where I want to create an impact and I'm constantly improving myself, I am on an individual journey, right? Uh, I'm on a sol solo journey uh, trying something. As part of the journey, I will probably be partnering with different people at different phases. For example, as part of my engineering, I partnered with certain group of people. As part of my work life in Infosys, I partnered with certain people. But if I go back and say, you know what, we work together in Infosys and this guy is now in this position, I am in this position. Those thoughts do come to all of us, but that is a wrong comparison to me. Question is, why was I in Infosys? Why am I doing what I'm doing now? And how am I trying to get better at what I'm doing, right? And once you have that mindset, I think that that's, that's like the best, right? Uh, 
work is not enjoying enjoyable because i am in a particular company work is enjoyable because i am in a place where i believe i am meant to be right um i i enjoyed life in Ra ramakrishna college right my friends studied in psd tech at that time i really don't they are most likely or definitely earning much more than me today but i have no regrets i have some of the best friends i made uh, in life there in fact some one of them is coming in the next 10 15 minutes home uh so uh, you can't really live life like that but at the same time it doesn't mean so i can do whatever i want right if i'm choosing not to compete with the crowd or a peer group what is going to push me what is going to push me is wanting to be the very best that i can be in my field and improving every day on it right and when you do that when you put all of these five things together whatever external stress hits us at any point of time you will find that you might be the person that others come to for help that you might be the person in your college in your company in your family in your friend circle who is able to help others who are affected by that uh, particular breaking point right and you might actually become more valuable during that time because you are able to not just survive during the crisis but you are actually able to add value help people during that crisis point right and that's what i wanted to share with you right at it really uh, doesn't matter what stage you are in your career it doesn't matter where your career is whether it's industry academics student life really doesn't matter what we are talking about is a mindset um, the mindset is the same irrespective of the context and when you start doing this i can tell you um like opportunities are always out there right and that's one thing i've noticed in my company right now there are possibly uh, i can easily say there are 50 openings right and the thing is if somebody is coming in with an anti fragile mindset it doesn't matter we will make space for them and that's an understanding which a lot of people don't have they think oh how many people will this company take hey if michael jackson comes in will you say no boss there's no space for you if steve jobs comes in of course both of them have passed away so if they come in we'll be shocked but you get the thing right like if somebody is at that level you will make space for them so the question is not whether the company has an opportunity opening the question is are you at are you and i at such a level that the company will Number one, if there's a crisis, not let me go. Number two, will make space for me, irrespective of uh, how the situation is. And that's what I wanted to share with you. My last slide is just some books that I think uh, I'd like you guys to read. Uh, if you don't, if you're not in the habit of reading books, don't worry. There are enough YouTube lectures where the same author talks about the concepts in an hour. Uh, one thing I've learned about books is uh, there's a difference between reading fiction and non-fiction. Uh, fiction is a story, so you have to read from start to end. Non-fiction is not a story, so you can choose to read any concept that you like. You don't have to have a compulsion to finish the book, right? A lot of people don't start books because they feel they can't finish it. Not needed. You don't have to finish it, right? So that's what I wanted to share with you guys. I'll be happy to take, uh, you know, a little bit. I went a little few minutes over time, but uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take it. or uh, you can always email me at abhishekvpaul@gmail.com thank you thank you very much abhishek thank you abhishek thank you very much abhishek abhishek i am ravichandran Asi sir how are you ha ah, fine fine how are you where are you now na chennai la irken sir i'm uh, in chennai kiss flow or ah. product company la irken yeah 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 i've been here for 5 years yeah okay, very nice okay. to hear your voice <laughs> <laughs> very nice talk ha huh? thank you thank you sir thank you thank you all the best best wishes happy new year Yeah, you too, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining you, this. It means a lot to okay. me. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Abhishek. Thank you, Abhishek. Bye. 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 Uh, uh,
Abhishek. Abhishek, and I'm not sure if you remember me. I'm your junior. <laughs> the 2005 batch. So, hey, um, how are you, man? You used to, I'm good, I'm good. So we used to sit in the same bench like uh, while taking up those tests. Uh, um, <clears throat> it's, it's definitely a different topic. And uh, last week we had this uh, uh, webinar on uh, a zero to one as well. So it was another uh, interesting presentation. So uh, was it's nice to same? see you. And I see. Was Sorry? it on this book? Yes, yes. Uh, no, no, no. It was not from this book, but the topic was zero to one. Like she was like uh, alumni of SREC. She joined IAMK. So it was a nice topic and <clears throat> definitely like uh, so the, the way you projected that cultural. Uh, I, I mean, uh, my, my question was like, is there any specific reason you call it as cultural fit? But obviously, right, it's self explanatory that uh, um, cultural you want Sorry, I didn't get that. Cultural head, uh, you said culture head, right? Culture, culture head of shepherd. Flow, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Culture shepherd, sorry. Okay, so I see a few names actually. Not sure, like, if those are your classmates. I see Shripati. I'm not sure, like, we used to call someone as Bombay Bombay. I'm not sure if he's the guy nah, who has joined. He's in Taiwan. Okay, okay, Shripati. Padi, okay, okay. Hi, okay. hi, hi, everybody. Hi, Abhi. <laughs> so, Padi is in a very senior position in Taiwan. I forget the name of the company. Padi, in the company. Hello, hello, Abhi. Hello, Anand. Hello, everybody. Hi. Happy New Year. Nice seeing you all. Hey, nice. <laughs> so, interestingly, Anand, that culture shepherd, I don't solve it. See, mm -hmm. it's a simple conversation with the CEO, right? Uh, he said, okay, you're joining. What designation do you want? I told him designation doesn't matter, right? You can put it X if you want. Uh, he said, we can't put it as X. So why don't we, and we just spoke for two, three minutes and he said, let's put culture shepherd. Now it's not like an industry, is that the title? No. Is there a junior culture shepherd, senior culture shepherd? No. Uh, on papers, my designation is director, whatever it is, but I always go with this culture shepherd because he says, see, that reminds everybody in the organization what, what my role is. And it's a personal reminder for me also what my responsibility is. But we just said in the problem, okay, this is the best solution. Let's do it. There is no other, uh, yeah, it's not like a career ladder. Yep, yep, yep. It's a, it's a different experience. I am cognizant of 14 years. The reason I joined a kind of like a startup like eight months back. So, um, so good. And I'm a follower of uh, Mr. Suresh Amandam. So, like I used to read his sports and blogs, so he's very inspirational. So yeah, he's uh, amazing, he's it, it's good to get connected yeah. with you again. So yeah. yeah, same here, man. Very nice to see you. Nice. Okay. Okay. Uh, email quarter can just uh, send me sure, a message. Connect you through LinkedIn. Chat LinkedIn la connect can. Na paata. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. And since it's uh, SREC, I'm giving my phone number also. You guys can WhatsApp me. Super. Thanks, guys. Anything else, Thomas? Uh, any other questions or do we wrap it up? Yeah, Abhishek. Yeah, one question from my side. Yes, Professor. Yeah. Uh, uh, you have completed your degree in the year 2005 and uh, uh, my question is, what is the major uh, attitude change or uh, the significant change among the student community who is uh, who, are, who are completing their degree now and you people? Both are same or? Uh... Uh, okay, I completed in 2004. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, no, no problem. <laughs> uh, I think one major change I notice is their exposure is much greater. So, or Madri, uh, they're able to understand what's in the industry, I think, through their internships and whatever they're doing, uh, they're okay. able to, uh, and projects are also nice. They're able to practically do a lot more things. Uh, yeah. This is nice to see. Um, actually, yeah, I think, and even it's like we hire people from like rural colleges also. Okay. I mean, English one might be different. Uh, yeah. But clarity, 
and the technical skills are really good to see. Okay. Uh, so the problem is not in their first uh, three to five years of their career. The problem okay. comes after that. Adhikapron, or mari predictable a pono. I need a higher salary. Adhikaga job shift panwanga. Okay. So uh, they get diverted a little bit, and uh, sometimes they don't have enough. I still feel uh, we need mentors to guide them. Like I, I was lucky. In Infosys joined one of those. Somebody mentored me. Okay. Uh, the mentorship is not. College le teachers are panga. Then when they start work, there are some people who guide them. But once they cross three to five years, pretty much on their own. And the time le those who get the right clarity or mentors are able to go to the next level. So, uh, do you think they are very much uh, constrained about their financial position after uh, five years of their uh, professional journey like that, or constrained? Means, I think all of us are. That's why I always yeah. say, like, money could be your second priority, especially if you are good. The money automatically follows. Okay. And the other thing is, uh, yeah, I, that's something I've noticed. If you are good, you always there is somebody always willing to pay for you. Uh, and the other thing is, you are able to make up money over time. Like in between, I one year I didn't work anywhere, right? I joined a startup, I lost my job there. So one year I was without work. So today, when I'm five years ago, if you ask me, okay, because I lost the job, I got into Kiss Flow, and now five years I've been doing well, and I've been able to make up. So on the perspective, that's what a mentor does. A mentor okay. will say, it's okay. Long term, the pathing na. You'll be able to make up, but getting on the right track is important. Today, a lot of people are following Suresh on social media. I have the opportunity to work with him daily, right? Okay. Daily, you can talk to him. Adala, na mal calculate panna mudiyad. So, andha mari da. But I wouldn't. I think we Padhi is also here, right? We were as money minded as anybody is today. I don't think that's changed. Um, but I think uh, opportunities are more now. Okay. So, Okay. That is the one thing I would say. Thank you, thank you, Abhishek. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is it Gopu, sir, or is it? No, no, no. Uh, it is uh, another Gopu, Professor Gopu, who is in Tripoli, and Gopu sir in EC. Oh, EC okay. department now. Yeah. Vasan sir. Sir, hello. Yeah. Shall we wind up? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Any questions from your side? That's it. That's it. Thomas, uh, are you in? Hello, Thomas, sir. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Praveen. Uh, Vidya? Sir, good evening, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, audible. You proceed. Thank you, sir. A very good evening to one and all connected through this call. Wishing you all a very happy and prosperous New Year 2022. I take this opportunity in proposing word of thanks for this alumni webinar series. First and foremost, I would like to thank our resource person, Mr. Abhishek V. Paul, 2004 Bachelor alumnus of Tripoli, for spending his quality time with us and for accepting our uh, invitation. Uh, for giving this wonderful talk. Thank you so much, sir. Next, I would like to thank our uh, president, Mr. Vasant Kumar, sir, for his uh, presence today. And I would like to thank Mr. Thomas, sir, and Eva Kritika, madam, for hosting this session. I would also like to thank all the alumni members of SREC who joined this session. Last but not least, I take this opportunity in thanking all the faculty members and students of SREC for actively taking part in this webinar. Thank you all. Thank you one and all once again. Thank you. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, all. I'm sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jake. Thank you very much.